With all the preaching that I do on using voltage drop as a testing method to help you find electrical faults, you would think that I thought voltage drop was a bad thing. Well, it is if it's not supposed to be there. But there are times when voltage drop is a design and component of an electrical circuit. And that's the subject for this edition of the trainer. I'm sure if you've been following the trainer series, you know by now what I refer to when I refer to voltage drop. Voltage drop is what happens to voltage after it's used to overcome the resistance of a component in the circuit. Actually, all the resistances in the circuit are going to claim their fair share of the voltage applied. And by the time we get to the end, all the available voltage will have been consumed. Now everything in the circuit has some resistance. This includes the wire, the splice points, the connectors, and of course the load, or the component that is actually doing the work in the circuit. And it's the load that is normally the primary source of resistance we consider. All the others, even when added together, amount to very little when compared to the resistance of the load itself. And that's what makes voltage drop testing so effective. If there are additional sources of unwanted resistance in the circuit, the voltage they're stealing is easy to spot. But detecting voltage drop is not always a bad thing. Voltage drop is used on purpose in some electrical circuits, so it's critical that you read the schematic and understand how the circuit functions or you may find yourself taking a wrong turn on your diagnostic path. The easiest example of an engineered voltage drop that I can think of is the conventional blower motor resistor assembly. Let's take a look at how the engineer used the voltage drop principle to control the blower motor speed in a 2000 Chevrolet Lumina. If you need a refresher on how to read and understand a wiring diagram, Go back and take a look at our June 2018 The Trainer. Now I'm not going to go through all the steps in this example, but I will when we look at the second example of designed in voltage drop. Now back to the Lumina. Our voltage supply enters the blower motor switch assembly on the brown wire at connector 1, terminal D, after passing through fuse number 4 in the fuse block. From here, let's follow it through the low speed position first. With the switch in low, the brown wire is connected to the yellow wire in the same connector 1 at terminal B. From there, it passes to the blower motor resistor assembly located in the HVAC casing. This is not at all unusual. After all, current passing through these resistors is going to generate heat. So the engineers place the resistor assembly inside the HVAC case to take advantage of the internal airflow to help keep the resistors cool and extend the life of the component. Continuing to follow the power side of this circuit, you can easily see that it has to pass through all three resistors in the resistor block. For the sake of clarity, let's just say that all three resistors and the blower motor have the same amount of resistance in the circuit. We don't need to assign a value, it's enough to know they're equal. With what we know about voltage drop, that means that each resistance will demand an equal share. So in this case, each resistor will drop 3 volts when an even 12 volts is applied. So by the time we get to the blower motor, how much voltage is left over for it? That's right, only 3 volts. Now, do you think it's going to run at full speed with only 3 volts? Hey, that's basic Ohm's law, isn't it? Every time voltage goes down, current goes down, with resistance being the same. Lower current 
means a lower fan speed. With that understood, it's easy to see what happens when the switch is moved to the next two speed positions, labeled M1 and M2. With the switch in M1, and following the tan wire to the resistor assembly, you can see that now there are only three resistances in series, two resistors and the fan motor. So what will the available voltage to the blower motor be now if we apply an even 12 volts? If you said four volts, you're absolutely right. And with the increase in voltage, we have an increase in current, don't we? And that means that the blower motor will turn a little bit faster than it did on low. With the switch in M2, the light blue wire, there were only two resistances in series, isn't there? Now how many volts will the blower motor get? If you've been following on, you figured it out. With only two equal resistances sharing that 12 volts, each will now get six volts. Six volts higher, more current, even more blower motor speed. Finally, note what happens when we move the switch to the high position. Follow the orange wire. Where does it go? Rather than feed the blower motor, the system power passing through the switch is now used to energize a relay. And with the relay turned on, the contacts close and the blower motor is fed system power directly via the number 14 fuse. I suspect they used a relay to provide a direct path when the blower motor is in high speed to protect the switch and the HVAC control head. Consider at high speed, now we're feeding maximum current through the circuit. And when that blower motor first turns on, it can take up to three times more current to get it moving than it does to keep it moving. Now let's move on to our next example. This is a cooling fan circuit for a 2003 Chevrolet Malibu. If you don't have one handy, I'm going to encourage you to put the video on pause and go print one out. Trace the diagram yourself and then return and follow along with me. Okay, did you try it out? You got your diagram handy? Let's go ahead and get started. The first step is to locate the load or loads in the circuit. In this case, there are two cooling fan motors and they're labeled left and right. The next step that I use when reading a wiring schematic is to go from the load and follow the wiring trying to find my way back to the battery. I want to identify both the power side of the circuit and the ground side. Let's start with the left cooling fan and its light blue wire on the B terminal. Moving upward, we see it enters the cooling fan mini relay number one. What is a relay? A relay is really nothing more than an electronic switch. And when you're tracing the schematic, you must consider, is it being used as a control device in the path? or is it actually a load in the circuit path? What side of the relay is the light blue wire coming in on? Certainly looks like the control side, doesn't it? And we can see the switch indicated on the diagram. But it's not connected, is it? Remember, when you're looking at relays and other switches on a wiring diagram, they're typically shown in their normal state. In this case, the relay is normally open and the relay will have to be energized before that switch will close. But we do know that the light blue wire will eventually pass through the relay to the fuse number eight, cooling fan one, and again back to the source of power. So we've completed the power side of the circuit. We'll worry about what actually turns that relay on a little bit later. Let's go back and identify the ground side. On pin A of the left cooling fan motor is a white wire that also goes to a relay. In this case, it's the cooling fan mode mini relay. Now the first time I saw this, I had to ask myself, 
What the heck is a cooling fan mode relay? Let's continue tracing the schematic and see if we can figure it out together. The white wire is also on the control side of this relay, isn't it? But here, the switch contact is normally closed, so we can continue our trace. From the relay, it goes to a splice at the gray wire on the control side of the cooling fan number two mini relay. At this point, we've identified the power side of the circuit back to the battery, haven't we? And we should now be working on the ground side, also heading back to the battery. But where is the gray wire going? It's going to the right cooling fan motor. Okay, so did this throw you for a loop? Don't let it. Let's stop and think about what's going on here. First, we've already identified the power side of the left cooling fan motor circuit, haven't we? It's the light blue wire going through the relay that, when closed, will connect it to power. So now we're on the other wire of the cooling fan motor, trying to find the path back to ground. And it led us right dead to the right cooling fan motor, didn't it? Well, let's remember something. There are certain elements that every circuit has to have. A load, a source, control device, circuit protection, and then of course the path that connects it all together. And we're right dead into the right cooling fan motor, aren't we? There's no way that the cooling fan motor can any, be anything but a load. So what that tells us is that now we have two loads in this circuit and they're wired in series, aren't they? It's on the same path. But we're not going to let that stop us. We're going to march right through the coil fan motor windings out the other side still seeking that final spot we're looking for, the negative terminal on the battery. Exiting the right cooling fan motor on pin A, the black wire, we follow that back to the underhood fuse block, passing through a fuse labeled cooling fan number two ground fuse. Finally, we exit the fuse block and we complete the ground path at G103. Okay. Let's go back and see how we turn the relay on for the left cooling fan motor. This is relatively straightforward. With power supplied to the relay on one side and grounded by a driver in the PCM, we have the dark green wire on connector 2, terminal 6, labeled as the low speed cooling fan relay control. I'm betting you already know why it has that name. When the relay is energized, the two cooling fans are wired, as we said, in series. And that means each gets its share of the supplied voltage, approximately half of what it would get on its own. So how fast do you think the fans will turn? That's right, that's what allows the fans to operate at low speed. Now consider this is an example of voltage drop that's designed in by the engineers for the express purpose of controlling the loads in that circuit. If you hadn't taken the time to read and understand the schematic prior to your voltage drop testing, finding that voltage on the ground side of the left cooling fan motor may have thrown you for a loop and taken you off your diagnostic path. So that's always the essential first step. Do your homework, read and understand the diagram, plan the test you're gonna take, and you'll have more success when it comes to solving your customer's electrical concerns. Thanks for watching.